We have a third guest joining us today in the studio. It's Friday. Every Friday we have a Health Friday conversation. And this is by design because we must have these conversations about health. We may ignore and talk about everything else. But if we don't talk about health, whether it's mental health, physiological health, ni shaurietu. And we cannot let it be shaurietu. Mm -hmm. uh, our guest is Dr. Afrin Shafi. She is a gynecologic oncologist. Yes, a gynecologic oncologist. <laughs> it, was, it was just confusing as much earlier. Like, okay, so how do you even say this? Gynecologic oncologist, <laughs> Dr. Afrin Shafi, good morning. Good morning, Eric. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Okay. That's a hot seat of the Situation Room. But because you are talking about uh, health issues, it's not going to be hot. Okay, we'll make it as comfortable as possible <laughs> because we're here to learn this morning. We want to talk about endometrial cancer and we want to understand everything about uh, these cancers and what they do. So tell us, you work at SCGCCK Cancer Center. So very many GGGs and GGGs. What is HCGCCK Cancer Center? So basically, it is a cancer center which deals with cancer. We treat cancer patients here. We administer chemotherapy, um, radiotherapy, and then we diagnose. Um, there's also the surgical part. However, uh, we usually take them to uh, different hospitals to operate on them, and then we continue their care at the cancer center. In addition to that, of course, we have counseling and uh, palliative care as well. Mm -hmm. So this is what we do. And we get patients from all over Kenya who are who come directly to the cancer center or who are referred uh, to us from uh, different physicians and uh, different clinicians <coughs> across the country, basically. Is it outpatient or inpatient or both? Basically, it's outpatient. We don't have an inpatient. However, if patients do require admission, then we do admit them to Ampisha Hospital or depending um, on their financial uh, situation, we can also admit in other facilities where they will be able to pay up for the facilities. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so oh. this is just right next to Ampisha? Uh, yes, it's right next to Ampisha Hospital. Seen it. Okay. So, I mean, it's purely for cancer care. It's purely for cancer care. Okay. And so, today, we're looking at a specific kind of cancer. I mean, it's pretty scary already to think that there is another one which is, you know, so specific. But the fact that we're talking about it means that it is also prevalent. Right? So, yeah. and the... Okay, I'm going to leave that to you now. Mm. Uh, endometrial cancer is what we're talking about now. What exactly is this? And again, that it has been given a name and that we studies have been done on it means that it's worrisome already. What are we, what are we looking at here? So, yes. Um, thank you for that question, actually. Yes. Uh, so, basically, when we say endometrial cancer, so we have the uterus. A uterus is basically um, the place where a baby usually grows. Mm -hmm. So the uterus has an inner lining and an outer part. The inner lining of the uterus, this is what's called the endometrium. Mm -hmm. So this is where the cancer occurs. There uh, this growth of abnormal cells and these cells will continue to grow and eventually they form a cancer. Mm -hmm. So this is where the cancer occurs in this inner part of the cancer. Uh, uterus lining. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it, there are certain risk factors that are, that are associated with it. Mm. And uh, the main risk factors uh, that are associated with is excess estrogen levels. So these excess estrogen levels can occur due to various uh, factors such mm. as um, obesity is one of the common causes of endometrial cancer. In mm. fact, if you're looking at Kenya right now, we are, our lifestyle is changing. We're moving, uh, we are adopting more of a Western lifestyle, you know, mm. and, and hence this cancer is on the rise because of that, you know. Of course, dietary factors also contribute significantly to this. In addition to that, um, we have conditions such as polycystic ovarian syndrome. So this is an abnormality with uh, hormonal production through the ovaries you know so this will again lead to excess estrogen levels and then other factors such as diabetes hypertension and if you look at it overall mm. most of these can be attributed to our change in lifestyle so it's lifestyle 
majority yes lifestyle there are of course other familial uh, issues as well but yeah. they are they contribute to a significant less around 10 percent of these cancers mm. but majority 80 percent of these cancers are due to lifestyle and the excess estrogen levels i can okay yeah so i was trying to make that connection yes because i think about the endometrial lining and i just connect that only with childbirth and the cycle and all of this for women but then i'm at pains to make the connection between that for me purely physiological you know part of you and then lifestyle and then how that can affect and it would affect just here uh, uh, how does that how does it work so basically uh, i mean like for example we talk about lung cancer we talk about like for example this smoking has or, or uh, many lung cancers have been attributed to smoking i can see that connection yeah. I cannot see how endometrial cancer is connected to lifestyle. Okay, so what happens is when uh, we are eating unhealthy foods, we mm. put on weight. Mm. So when we put on weight, there's a lot of estrogen production. You okay. see, uh, we have a lot of adipose tissue. So this is converted into estrogen. Okay. And that estrogen will now go on, uh, will go and act on the endometrial lining. So what estrogen normally does is, let me take you a little bit to the basic Please. physiology. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So what the estrogen does is it will lead to proliferation, meaning it will lead to a rapid growth growth of the endometrial cells you know mm. so when cells are growing uh, rapidly they tend to divide very rapidly you know and in the process they acquire sometimes mutations basically right. mm. and these mutations you just need one abnormal cell and then you continue growing a lot of abnormal cells mm. and there it becomes cancer so you see uh, when we change our lifestyle mm. when we live a healthy lifestyle we have less obesity and mm. then that will decrease the production of uh, that is endogenous production of estrogen you know yeah. so that indirectly will actually reduce um, studies have demonstrated reduction of weight will lead to reduction of 50 to 80 percent of endometrial cancer which is a substantial decrease in ca the risk actually oh yeah what I have so many questions. Okay, so <laughs> what, what are the symptoms of this? Um, is it silence like we've seen with the cervical mm. or is it full-blown symptomatic okay that's a very good question yes uh, when it comes to symptoms uh, women usually tend to pre uh, present with abnormal bleeding you know and when I say abnormal bleeding they can have intermenstrual bleeding you know mm. bleeding between in between the menstrual cycles you mm. know or sometimes they have very heavy menstrual bleeding the other thing is sometimes postmenopausal women any sort of bleeding in postmenopausal women is abnormal. You know, we usually tend to hear patients utter this phrase, uh, this phrase, sorry, uh, oh, when they start bleeding or they have a new bleeding, they'll say, oh, I've become younger. Mm. But you see, it's not that you become younger, they have become, it's a disease. And they sit back and say, it's okay, you know. And I think this knowledge uh, women need to know that any bleeding is not normal. Don't sit back. Come. Come to the physician. It's okay to come and get a negative uh, report. Mm -hmm. Get examined. But you see, sometimes we just tend to ignore and put it behind at the back of our minds, you know. And this is seen both in the rural and urban area populations, mm -hmm. rather, you know. Of course, there are other factors in the rural um, population that contribute to the delayed presentations. But in the urban uh, population, you'd see someone will say, okay, I am going to work, I'll go tomorrow, tomorrow, and we keep on postponing it, you know. But like I said, it's a symptom that uh, any bleeding, I would say, is abnormal. At least get it investigated, you know. Mm -hmm. So for endometrial cancer, most of the women will present with abnormal uterine bleeding, basically. <coughs> yeah. it's, it's it's you, it's bleeding. Mm. It's bleeding mostly. Uh, sometimes you won't see nothing like nothing else, like not nothing like you know fever and sudden mm. loss pain. of weight. Okay, it's not pain. particularly in the starting. Right. Of course, these are symptoms that will occur at advanced disease uh, when the disease has advanced. Okay. So those are like weight loss when the cancer is much advanced, or you'll see an abdominal swelling. But earlier, you see uh, bleeding is the main. It's a first sign. That yes, you, it's the like, earliest ought symptom. to concern you. Absolutely. Yes. Are you able to detect it earlier? Uh, yes, if women come with these symptoms, yes, we are able to detect it. We do an office biopsy, mm -hmm. meaning that it's a small procedure that's done, that can be done in an office. You know, mm -hmm. when we have women who come with these symptoms, we take a detailed history, we examine them, and then go on, on to 
uh, do the biopsies, you know, in uh, women uh, who we suspect may be having these cancers. Of course, we also do ultrasounds, but what diagnoses it? What is the diagnostic uh, test is a biopsy. Okay. It's stageal, like the other cancers, is it? Or is it once you get it, it's full blown? No. Uh, so, like I said, uh, it is staged basically, and some women present in earlier uh, stages. Mm -hmm. When they present in earlier stages, of course, the treatment outcomes are definitely good. With the advanced stages, as you know, the treatment outcomes may not be as good and are rather poor, you see. Mm -hmm. But the staging is usually surgical staging, meaning uh, we can uh, clinically look at it and say yes, but then, however, if we want to give it a stage, we need to take the patients to theater, operate on the patient mm. and uh, see inside. You see, sometimes we have, uh, not sometimes, we have imaging modalities, you know, that however, uh, to do a comprehensive staging, the patient needs to go under, uh, uh, needs to undergo a surgical procedure to do the same. Mm. Yes. Okay. How then do you treat um, this particular cancer? So again, a uh, good question. Now, the treatment will depend on a number of factors, you know. Uh, of course, it depends on the stage. The main thing is the stage of the cancer. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, risk factors a patient may have, you know. Sometimes patients are too sick to undergo any surgical procedure, and then we just offer, and the cancer is too advanced. In that case, they may just uh, require um, um, uh, just palliative treatment or supportive care or medical treatment. Of course, the standard treatment for this is a uh, hysterectomy. Now, when I say a hysterectomy, mm. so this is removal of the uterus. Uh, we remove the uterus and then we go on to remove the ovaries as well. And we do a staging, uh, meaning we remove the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are basically uh, places where the cancer spreads through, the tissue where the cancer cells will drain so it's one of the first place where the tissue uh, cancer will through which the cancer will spread yeah. so that is why a comprehensive surgical staging like i said will uh, guide the management so once you know this because of course when the cancer has spread the um, the cancer treatment will be more advanced like yeah. Some patients who have early disease, just the hysterectomy, just the removal of the uterus and the ovaries is sufficient. However, in some women who the cancer is advanced, in addition to the surgical management, now you will go in to give chemotherapy. And when I say chemotherapy, I mean these are drugs actually that mm -hmm. kill the uh, cancer cells or radiotherapy so or a combination of both. Mm -hmm. So patients will require this. Now, the other thing is in Kenya, let's say 10 years back, we had one or two gyne oncologists in Kenya who were treating these cancers. But today, we have 21 fully trained gyne oncologists spread across Kenya. Mm. So you see, it's g easier, at least we have the skilled personnel to do the appropriate management, to offer the appropriate management to these patients. And the good thing is at least they're spread across Kenya. Mm. They're in, they in Nairobi, you look at Eldoret, Mombasa, everywhere. So at least patients can get the uh, appropriate care, you see. Mm. Gyne oncologists basically are doctors who go, who are gynecologists, and then they go on to specialize for an additional two to three years training just to uh, learn about these cancers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to be careful with this question because I don't want to say, and I guess it's good you're here because then you can, look, the other cancers that we look at, that we see that affect women, um, some are hereditary or yeah. have an, uh, um, you know, familial type. Exactly. Others, you know, a virus could then cause this cancer to then take root and grow. Mm. But what I'm hearing you say about this, can we use the word that it's purely lifestyle cancer? Is mm. there another way that you can get that? Because then, for me, that would be good news if there wasn't. Because then that meant that it would be purely preventable. Okay, so not only... That's what I'm saying. I want to be very careful. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good, good, actually. Yeah, it's good. Let me shed more light on that. So 80% of these cancers are type 1 cancers. Like I mentioned earlier, on, those are related to excess estrogen. Yeah. And one of the f ways uh, you get extra excess estrogen is through lifestyle. Mm. And of course, other conditions such as diabetes or... Um, uh, diseases such as polycystic ovarian disease. 10% of endometrial cancers are 
through uh, familial, basically, hereditary, yeah? And they're associated with conditions such as Lynch syndrome. So this is basically a syndrome, a group of cancers, mm. which is related... Um, which is related like colorectal cancers, meaning cancers of the gut. And um, they have other cancers also are hereditary, such as Cowden's disease. You know, this is also again another uh, syndrome, which is associated with endometrial cancers, breast cancers. So yes, 10% of these endometrial cancers are hereditary. Mm -hmm. And it's not absolutely lifestyle, mm -hmm. but these are a different subset of uh, risk factors. These are different risk factors, but yes, they will... Uh, form about 10% of these endometrial cancers as well. So it's not purely lifestyle. Can you tell the cause of the presentation in an individual? Can you tell, for example, if somebody presented with endometrial cancer today, yeah. would you then be able, through the tests and scans, and say the cause of this is familial, we can see, or it is lifestyle in an individual yes we can tell basically okay. so what you do is uh, when someone comes to us we do ad additional testing as well once we've diagnosed ideally uh, in kenya we have limitations in terms of doing genetic markers yeah but if you go to the high income countries they're easily accessible even in some of the private uh, facilities here they're accessible so we can do genetic testing in these women mm. particularly in women who have a family history of uh, colon cancers or rectal cancers they have a family history of breast cancers so these women we know already clinically yes they have a higher risk but ideally today the management of endometrial cancer is changing you know it's not only based on uh, previously we just uh, we were doing chemotherapy and radiotherapy but currently we're moving more towards molecular testing and treatment that is targeted at these uh, molecular uh, mark, uh, pathways, you know. So yes, we do test, and yes, when we test, we can tell whether this is associated with a familial condition or this is not associated with a familial condition. Mm. Yes. Can you reverse it? You know how people who are have type two diabetes can reverse the symptoms, and then you go back to in the in those patients where you have been able to see for i mean for instance <coughs> excuse me where you've been able to see that the cause of this is lifestyle there are so many things that then point to the increase of the production of estrogen is it possible to reverse this cancer growth okay by lifestyle change if it was lifestyle okay cause? i would say you see where i'm going <laughs> yeah no i get you so <laughs> i wouldn't say it's possible to reverse the uh, cancer however it's possible to prevent the cancer and this we can do through uh, like um, healthy lifestyle living a healthy lifestyle you know mm. and women who have like polycystic ovarian disease we can start them on treatments such as combined oral contraceptives they're, they're used as first line treatment uh, prophylactic me meaning first line preventive uh, treatment basically for um, to prevent development of mm. endometrial cancers mm. and patients with hereditary conditions such as Lynch syndrome even these women can be given um, uh, treatment uh, such as preventive treatments such as hormonal uh, contraceptives of course women when we have uh, identified that these are women who have Lynch syndrome they can be offered prophylactic surgical treatments meaning preventive surgical um, therapies such as removal of uh, the uterus you know before these women develop the cancers of course in our society it's very difficult to tell a, uh, a woman you know mm. because of our social norms and uh, to just remove your uterus you know yeah. mm. there's so much stigma associated hard, so yeah. many mm. yes you know so you can't say hey just remove your uterus you know no but of course we will uh, aim towards uh, early screening in this cohort of women you know at least we would ask them to get annual uh, biopsies mm. and uh, put them on contraceptives you know again even breast cancer women who are on treatment for breast cancer such as uh, tamoxifene basically these women are also at an increased risk of uh, developing cancers so at least we can offer them early screening to come for annual mm -hmm. uh, screening tests you know so at least we're able to pick the cancers earlier and give them treatment right. earlier dr afrin shafi is a gynecologic is <laughs> a gynecologic oncologist 
We are talking about endometrial cancer today and we are learning a lot and also um, on what you need to do about this. Are you an employer in Kenya? Switch to IM at work today and sign up your employees to Kenya's largest unsecured personal loan today. Call 0719-088-000 today. IM. Tunakujali. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice F. Today, it's about endometrial cancer, and we have an expert in the studio. Dr. Afrin Shafi is a gynecologic oncologist. She works at the HCGCCK Cancer Center near Mpisha Hospital in Westlands. And we've been talking about and just understanding what it is all about, how you uh, detect it, what are the symptoms, what happens, what's the treatment, and you are talking about the screening. How often is a screening done and what is the procedure in screening? Oh, so again, this is a very, very important question. So when it comes to screening, there's no screening per se. We don't screen general population mm -hmm. for endometrial mm -hmm. cancer. What we do is when I talked about screening earlier, I meant women who are at risk, you know, like women with Lynch syndrome or women perhaps who are on treatment for breast cancer, such as women on drugs, such as tamoxifen. Yeah. The general population, we don't screen them. The other thing is uh, what we do advise or what we do advocate for is when you have an abnormal bleeding for the normal females, you know, go and visit the doc uh, your gynecologist or your gyno-oncologist. At least they can assess and then do the necessary tests, actually. And like I said, we start with the pelvic ultrasound and then we go on to do uh, bi biopsy. The other thing is postmenopausal women. Let me emphasize on this. Postmenopausal women with any bleeding, it's always some disease. Mm -hmm. It's some disease, so you need to go. It's pathological. It's not normal. So these are women who, even when they go to normal doctors, generalists, basically, general uh, obstetrician and gynecologists, so these women need to at least have an endometrial biopsy before they're taken for any further treatment, even for benign conditions, if they have a endometrial uh, well, uh, fibroids are not a very common uh, cause in, uh, of bleeding in postmenopausal women. But mm. if, say, you have a woman who's bleeding and you're suspecting fibroids, mm. never take these women to theater without actually doing an endometrial biopsy. And why am I emphasizing on this is mm. because, you know, sometimes we get too lazy and say we don't have the facility. So let's just take her for a, a yeah. surgical procedure, you know. Yeah. So uh, I think that's uh, something we need to stop. We need to focus more on offering the correct treatment and comprehensive treatment, basically. Because, you know, once you've done the surgical uh, treatment for a benign and then you a benign disease and then it comes back as cancer, you know, and this patient is not appropriately staged. Mm. And then now you start doing damage control, you know. Yeah. So that's why I emphasize that a proper and comprehensive workup is very, very necessary. Acting quickly mm -hmm. yeah, is yeah, important. Yeah, definitely acting quickly is necessary. As gynecologists, you advise women to come for periodic checks. Yes, we do definitely so advise. So the pap smear will not catch this? Highly unlikely, very rarely, but uh, it's not. Uh, pap smear basically will screen for uh, cervical cancer. Yeah. In some cases, it might suggest that there may be an ongoing pathology in the endometrium. But, uh, like I said, it's not a test that is used for detection of endometrial cancer. Mm. Yes. Okay. Um, the, the th when, when you hear things like this sometimes, you know, for some patients the thing would be, or would be patients, or anybody who has, you know, any of the physiological parts that is connected to this would think, okay, so then maybe I need to get into the place where I'm making sure that I do whatever I need to do to make sure that I don't... Assuming that I'm falling in the 80% of those who would get affected via lifestyle mm. habits, yeah. right? So what are some of the preventative measures that you can put in place? What should we be eating? What should, how should we be operating? How, what should we not be eating with, you know, frequency? Because that's the thing for me. I'm very, I'm, I, the, the cancer burden on the society and the way in which it has increased or become more prevalent is very worrying in the last just five years the numbers that we see today unprecedented and growing and so for me i think we're getting to that point whereby if there's something that can be done to prevent them in the future it absolutely must be done 
Yes, uh, yes. So this need, uh, these habits <coughs> need to be inculcated uh, in people from uh, when they're small, you know, mm. S high school. We tend to, now, like I said, we're moving towards more of a Western lifestyle. You know, mm. we're adopting a Western style lifestyle. A lot of junk food outlets, you know, we'll mm. go have pizzas, burgers, and then this increases childhood obesity. And over time, of course, then goes into adults who, are, who become obese, you know. Yeah. So when we talk about preventive, prevention starts at a very, very early stage, you know. Mm. So eating more greens, eating uh, enough adequate amount of uh, the high... Um, Fiber foods, you know, and drinking plenty of water. Exercising is very important. Physical activities, you know, a lot of us are, we go to our offices and we sit, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think if we are able to at least take an hour for ourselves and exercise, you know, so that is very, very important. So these are some things. And then, of course, uh, we need to educate people and uh, families on these healthy li living and healthy lifestyle, you know, mm -hmm. increase more vegetables and fruits in our um, uh, diet and switch more towards uh, white meats as compared to red meats. Not that I'm saying don't eat red meats, mm -hmm. meats but I'm saying switch to <coughs> switch more mm -hmm. to um, uh, white meats, you know. Mm -hmm. So these are some things at least we can do to prevent uh, some of these uh, diseases and cancers actually. How prevalent is the endometrial cancer in Kenya? So in Kenya currently, um, this is a little bit of an older data. We are we're expecting uh, a new data soon in, uh, by the end of this year. So annually, uh, uh, around 735 cases are detected of endometrial cancer. Uh, these are new cases. 735, 735 new, cases new cases every year. Annually, yes. This was as per the Global Can 2020, actually. So these numbers are... Perhaps, like I said, this is data. These are cancers, and these are women who came and to hospitals. And by detected, what do we mean? Uh, these are women who came to the hospitals, and they were diagnosed with endometrial cancers. Let's not forget there are very many people uh, who never get to, there are very many women who never get to the hospitals. Mm. So these numbers could be much, much more higher than the actual 735 cases, you know. And it's predicted uh, by 2020, uh, 2040, these numbers will go uh, will be as high as twice or four times what we are seeing now you know you're saying the data is old how old is this 2020 this is from global can 2020 which is published uh, between two to three years so we're expecting a new one uh, sometime this year so new cancer data is, is published every two to three years two to three years yeah why why so I think we need to assess uh, the, we look at the registries and then we need to see how many patients are coming and then we need to see the trends, how are the trends. So that is why, but of course, if you look at the cancer registries, every hospital, there are th three different types of cancer registries. So they're population based, hospital based and uh, specific cancer registries. So uh, these registries will have the annual data per year, how many patients are coming. But then we have a population based registries. Now these ones will compile everything and they will also show you the trends the rising trends over the years as who well. compiles this uh the government compiles these and then they publish this because we've got a national cancer what's institute. it called the national cancer, mm -hmm. cancer yeah. institute which is basically one of the things that it does is collecting the data yes, yes. and then of course analyzing the data and advising government on what to do yeah. i'm just wondering why why do over three years um, is this I guess adequate? Is this is this global best practice? I mean, why three years? Why why not two? Why not one? So why not like twice a year? Sorry, like I said, we have data, annual data every year. Yeah. But then uh, these are in specific like hospital-based registries. And then the national base, I, like I said, I think it's more to see the trends. Are they rising? Mm -hmm. So that is why it's seen over a couple of years. So is the trend the same like last year, 734? this year 735 so or there's a significant change yeah. so i guess this is just to see more of a trend but of course it's reported that these are the cases that are seen annually you know these are the cases that you see per year you know when the reports come out hmm. yeah okay do people i mean i know you talked about i'm just go, going back to his treatment and in and, and intervention uh, those who get a hysterectomy, for example, and you've been able to check the lymph nodes and all of this, and they're all right, do they go on then to live 
a normal life thereafter, even if they don't require chemotherapy or radiotherapy? And what is the survival rate of women who've been diagnosed? Okay, so um, when we talk about survival rates, now we talk in a five year or two year. So again, this will depend on the uh, stage of the cancer. So like I said, women who are, um, say who have no lymphatic spread, they, the lymph nodes are not spread, uh, involved and then they have a low risk type of endometrial cancer. Of course, the endometrial cancer, again, there are many types of endometrial cancer. Oh, good grief. I mean, you know? Uh, how, what? <laughs> there are types of endometrial cancer. Yeah. Yes. There are stages, then there are types. So, uh, so you see, there's a type that is very aggressive. Mm. Right. So okay. that aggressive cancer will progress really fast, regardless of the stage, as compared to a low risk cancer such as endometrioid type. Mm. And an endometrioid uh, type, for instance, that is uh, just a stage one. So such patients would have good survival as much as uh, 90 to 80 percent and then a stage two would have a stage two it has about 60 to 70 mm. stage three to um, four have a survival rates of uh, 20 to 30 percent you know so these are endometrial i'm talking about a less aggressive type and then there are those high uh, more aggressive types like the serous types these are very aggressive they metastasize meaning they spread, spread. at a very <coughs> rapid uh, stage so even these women with stage one cancers you know they progress really fast and the survivals are not as good as those with a low risk disease or a low risk uh, histological type, you know. When you say not as good, that means they will die. Uh, unfortunately, yes, they do go on to progress. Uh, the disease progresses fast and um, they do pass on. What What is the percentage of those who do in that risk stage? So. Uh, the type, the serious type? Are you talking mm -hmm. about serious types? Yes. Around 5% of endometrial, 2 to 5% of endometrial cancers are serious types mm -hmm. of endometrial cancers. So, and like I said, they are very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the squamous cell. Like I said, there are many, many types, you know. Mm -hmm. So, the less uh, aggressive type is the endometrioid. But again, of course, when we are doing this, there's also the stage to take into consideration the age of the woman. There are so many things into consideration mm -hmm. that we take, mm -hmm. and, you know. What's the likelihood that if a woman presents to a health facility, let's just say, yeah, she goes and says I have abnormal bleeding. Mm. What's the likelihood of an ordinary physician at a normal health facility being able to detect that this is endometrial cancer? Okay, so um, again, I'll come back uh, to this. Uh, cancer is, a re gyne oncology is a relatively new young field in Kenya. Mm. Like I said early on in my presentation that uh, when we went 10 years back, we only had one to two gyne oncologists. Currently, we have many. And the cancer, the data or the information, clinical uh, clinicians, uh, some of them do not have uh, a good knowledge of this so you will see some uh, clinicians may not even do a pelvic exam you know yeah. or do the early referrals so I wouldn't put a percentage to this I'll just say that uh, I think we need to increase the uh, decrease the threshold of uh, refer early referrals when we suspect something we need to refer them to the appropriate physicians or, uh, or clinicians as uh, soon as we can mm -hmm. you know we don't need to sit back and say it's okay let me manage this you know so it's important that we do that the other thing is of course for the women again you see um women like i said they will delay presenting to these facilities yep. and very low health seeking behavior has been noticed in our population yep. so we need to increase more awareness we need to uh, educate our women rather and like i said uh, radio is an absolutely a good modality like you know mm. even the woman in the peripheral facility or in the extreme rural uh, part of Kenya will have access to radio you yeah. know will be listening to the radio yeah. and will but they may not have access to the internet they may not have access to TV so I think we need to um, increase the advocacy increase awareness through whatever means we can and mm. in decrease the threshold of going to facilities of mm. seeking care mm. i think this is this is very very important so already there's that there's yeah. of course that very poor health seeking behavior yes. that we all have not well, not, not all but uh, some of us <laughs> have <laughs> many of us in kenya mm. and then when you go to a health facility the clinical officer may not be able the clinician may not be able to immediately pick this up yeah. what is the normal path when someone presents at a health facility what's the normal path of referral 
I mean, what are those thresholds? Refer this to what? The next, the higher, more senior doctor. At what point do you actually get to say, take this to a specialist? Okay, so um, now let me go back a little bit. Uh, I'll not uh, give an example of here in uh, Nairobi. You know, yeah. Nairobi, uh, someone would know, oh, yes, I, I need to go to a gynecologist. So I'll go, go to a gynecologist and he will or she will examine me and perhaps once they detect anything abnormal and refer me to a gynecologist. However, let's look at the uh, counties. Know. and uh, So in a county, normally when a woman goes, she may go to a dispensary. Yes. So she, sometimes it so happens, like I said, low level of education, even in among the healthcare workers is quite common. You know, yeah. so we need to also educate the healthcare workers in these facilities. So they may present to th a dispensary, and someone may say, "I have abnormal bleeding." So you see, they like I said, because of that low level, the person will treat instead of referring this patient perhaps to a, a sub-county hospital or a county referral hospital. I suspect she has abnormal. Let me do an ultrasound yeah. and pick up something and then refer to uh, an, uh, an obstet obstetrician and gynecologist. Right Currently, right now, we have uh, sub-counties and each sub-county has a referral hospital and they have sub-county hospitals. So when the patient goes to these sub-county hospitals, at least you will get at least a gynecologist, if not a medical officer at least. Yeah. And these when these medical officers are educated and they do, like I said, even an ultrasound, they say, ah, oh, this is not normal or I feel like this woman needs to be seen by a specialist. And then that person will either refer to the county referral hospitals or to other facilities where you will get these um, healthcare work, uh, these specialists, you know. Mm. All those yep. attach money, all right? Yes. <laughs> when you're referring from the health center to dispensary to local level two, level three, to level four, sub-county to level five county, all those things are money and time. And that is also likely to hinder this particular woman from actually ending up in the correct diagnosis. Yeah. So the ones that we are saying that 700 and how many? 35. Per year? 35 a year could be on the lower percentage. Yep. Okay. It's a good thing. The good news is at least in such a short uh, time we have 21 gynecologic oncologists in the country. What does it take to get one, to train one? I think it's a lot of resources, a lot of intense hard work for the country. So, uh, like I said, it takes two to three years now. Someone is already a practicing uh, obstetrician gynecologist. Mm. So when you go to now subspecialize, you have to stop all that. You practice, you leave all that, and you go to school. You know, so you train. It's a full time course. It's a full time course. Uh, right. There are no shortcuts. Okay. So you are in school. You're seeing uh, like if you go to um, in Kenya currently, there are two uh, centers or two universities that are training gynecologists. Uh, this is uh, Moy University and uh, Nairobi University. Mm. which and their affiliate hospitals mm. so um they have uh, again this is more of an apprenticeship yep. and learning through uh, people who who have more experience and then you're seeing a high number of these uh women coming to these facilities so yeah it's like i said it's very time consuming but at the end it's very rewarding mm -hmm. and um satisfying how can because here we are looking at uh, prevention being a factor that we want to be we want to include or an element that you want to include uh, towards health right yeah. then we're also looking at the element of care seeking behavior which you've already established is very low it doesn't matter whether you're the educated professional or the you know the low uh, lower educated individual it doesn't matter health seeking behavior is it ranks very low in terms of practice yeah. right yes even people that you think would, would we say or we would know better, you feel some kind of twinge here and there. The last, interestingly enough, the last place you're going is a doctor. You'll go to um, your colleague, you'll say, Afrin, please, what can this be? And we'll do Google diagnosis, if that, mm. right? Yeah. But we're also saying that from the medical field, people such as yourselves are saying we need to have these conversations more. So there must be a connect between the medical and the social. Yeah whereby there must be encouragement to seek care, to seek health care, yeah. to be interested in making sure that your health is optimal. 
how how from what you see how can that happen it used to be that you know you go to your doctor when you know things are bad but what we are saying now is that there needs to be a constant communion between the two medical social every day literally how do we do that uh yes so uh, again this is very important so you see when i uh, for instance i'll give you an example if i go to a if I go to a um, community and s ask the women, oh, you must go for screening or you need to go and visit a, a, a doctor, you know, they may not take it very uh, nicely, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's better to engage the community leaders, you know, be it uh, the pastors or the uh, imams, the elders of the community and the women in the community as mm -hmm. well who would talk to these women. So it's important we have that, we establish that pathway, you know, because if we don't, like I said, it would be very hard for people to listen to me, you know, mm -hmm. the common monenshi to say, ah, it's okay, Afrin is saying, so I need to go, but who is Afrin, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd be more, I would trust, say, someone who I've known more. Mm -hmm. So that is why it's important that we have these connections with these important people in the community, you know? So when we have these connections, at least we're able to advise the women appropriately. Mm. And just working with uh, community health workers and volunteers is very, very important. Very, very important. <sighs> you know, it's a conversation that we have all, all the time. Yeah. Here. I mean, we talk about the need for preventive and promotive health care to be the primary uh, focus in the country. So then it helps us to detect this and it saves us a lot of time a lot of resources and a lot of energy in just saving today a woman who's listening today and thinks okay i'd like to do something to avoid this what's the one message i'd say please do not wait <clears throat> when you have any abnormal symptoms don't wait for them to go away just go to a hospital as early as you can an abnormal is abnormal bleeding uh, as in for endometrial cancer yes abnormal bleeding please do not wait just go and see a doctor okay <sighs> Dr. Terry, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you. We've learned quite a bit mm. from Dr. Afrin Shafi. She is a gynecologic oncologist. It's taken you how many years to train to this? Um, around 13 to 15 years. 15 years? <laughs> yes. Of just studying and working and studying. So this just combined study time, 15 years. And of course, in between the 15 years, you've got to work as well. Yes, so I've you first of all practice as a gynecologist, uh, and then you decided, let me actually go and subspecialize. And you stopped that, went and did this in two years. Now you, okay, <laughs> power to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.